Do you have three hundred thousand dollars? No, <laughs> I do not. That's the average price for building a home. Around three hundred thousand dollars. So how can anybody afford to do that? Comment below if you want to no. share personally whether or not you have. 300k sitting there. Can I borrow some? That's, that's a very personal question too. I, I, I did you don't not. feel comfortable. You weren't ready for that. Approve that. To put that out on the internet. No, but I do not have that much. Uh, average price for building a home. Yeah. You can get a loan. You can get a loan. Uh, it's not as easy to get a loan on new construction, especially with raw land, and that's what we're talking about today. In this podcast, building, setting up a home on your homestead. From scratch. From scratch, which is what we're doing. Some affordable alternatives, building from scratch. Yeah, if you're not an experienced builder, how's that? That's a good point. A lot of these are very DIY friendly. Yeah. If you would someday like to build your own home on your homestead, today's episode is going to help you learn about different alternative types of buildings that might be easier, more affordable, even easier DIY for you to do. And at the end, we're going to share some of our bonus tips. On how we're actually doing this on a shoestring budget. Which yes. Is, I think, what we could say we have right now. Bow, you're, you're okay with admitting to the internet that you have a shoestring. Yes. <laughs> the world that we live in is a crazy place. This is a pandemic. And a toilet paper tussle. Inflation hitting a new... They are protesting. But you and me... We can make a difference by just starting a garden, harvesting rainwater, raising some meat chickens with a couple of friends. All these little steps, bit by bit, it makes life better for you, me, and our kids. So if you've wanted to start homesteading, or maybe just grow your homestead a little bit bigger this year, well, you found the right podcast. Cozy up, it's time for another episode of Homesteady. If you want to save money for building a home, you should buy less pants. You should buy less pants. Yep. You should just have one pair of pants that you wear every day to do your homestead chores, and they're durable, so they last. <laughs> <laughs> every time. And you should expect it by now. I don't. I was like, all right, this is like <laughs> millennials buy too many pants, and that's why they can't afford housing. That's probably true. Like, don't buy Starbucks or pants. Just walk around with no pants and you can build your own house. <laughs> this year, from about April 1st till about last week, we're recording this in December, I wore my Cujo Yardwear work pants. They are durable. They are flexible. It's 2020. You got to have the stretchy pants. They're breathable. So on those hot days, you feel nice and cool in them, which is why I'm not wearing them anymore. It's winter here. Yeah, I think you felt so good in them, you like forgot that it's November and not December. <laughs> <laughs> like lost a month of your life. You're just God. in pant ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to experience pant ecstasy, or maybe provide that for somebody you love this gift giving season, uh, get some Cujo Yardware work pants. They go great with your Cujo Yardware work shoes. They lit. I'm not joking, actually. I literally wore them every single day all summer long. They were pretty dirty at the end of the week, but they held up to all that homestead hard work. Flexible, breathable, durable. And you convinced your dad to get a pair. He l took them down to a project in Texas where it was like 100 degrees every day. He said it was like he was wearing shorts. Loved them, yeah. Fantastic. So if you like wearing shorts but still want to look professional... Millennials, I'm talking to you. Cujo Yardwear, check them out. We have a discount code that will last you a lifetime. So every pair of shoes, every pair of pants, coupon code HOMESTEADY. We'll link to it in the show notes. This episode is brought to you by Cujo Yardwear. Check them out. And they're really great with returns as well. Important when you're ordering online. Build yourself a house, wear one pair of pants all week. Cujo Yardwear. <laughs> and stop buying Starbucks. That's why we make our own coffee. That's because we don't live close enough to Starbucks. <laughs> we talked about this in our recent episode. We're going to start our homesteading dream with a yurt. 
back in the day when we pitched our parents the, the yurt, yurt dream. dream. It's the dream. They were not thrilled with that idea. You know. It was a little different, a little strange. I found an article that had some more beautiful ideas to pitch to your parents. So, <laughs> homesteaders, this article was about affordable alternative housing. It had 50 different types of housing Wow! that you could set up or do. This and, I have uh, not seen yet. You haven't? Here's a couple. Maybe six months ago, if I would have found this, it would have made all this oh, research you're easier. Like this. Ready? Mm -hmm. I can't read all 50, but I'm going to share a couple Highlights. of my favorites. And now it's time for another episode of Good Ideas from the World Wide Web. Brought to you by geosites.biz slash diamond. Number four, affordable housing alternatives for all you broke millennials. House it long term. <laughs> Can I watch your house and bring my cows and chickens and my six kids? I heard you guys were going to Disney. How long are you going for? And, so, and then you just end up squatting, right? They come <laughs> they back come and you're like, you're sorry, like, it's our house now. Guys. <laughs> so you house sit to squat. I think there's like a website out there where you can apply for this. <laughs> Number 12. This is sit to squat. <laughs> sit to squat.org. <laughs> <laughs> Number 12, move in with your parents. <laughs> <laughs> I essentially did that. But don't they understand that everyone searching for this article already is in their parents' house? <laughs> We're already living with our parents. <laughs> Number 19. Oh, this is a fun one. Go camping. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number 37. Well, not a helpful list. Because I was a surfer, this is my personal favorite. The Number 37. Couch surf. Ah. Uh. Your friends will love you. Yeah. yeah. All right. So those are bad ideas. Not really practical solutions. No. They're like short term, sure, but not long long term if you're looking at setting up your own homestead on your own piece of land. <laughs> Sit to squat is such a fun idea. <laughs> they would provide like legal, uh, you know, like we'll help you legally when your friends say, "Dear God, get out of my house." We'll make sure it's like that a they classifieds can. for hey, these people are going on vacation. Mm, they have a nice looking place. Looks pretty good. When you're comparing, I mean, we talked about it at the beginning there. Stick build or site built, however you want to call it, people will argue over the correct term. Traditional framing a house. A contractor shows up to your property with a set of blueprints and a foundation that's ready to go and he starts building from the ground up your house. Average now, of course, here's your disclaimer for the beginning of this episode. There's a lot of disclaimer. Yeah, in this whole episode, like regionally, everything's going to be different as far as climate. Yeah. Your legal restrictions. Yep. What you need, what you want. You can build a yurt for two hundred thousand dollars, and you can build a stick built home for fifty. Like <laughs> fifty dollars. Thousand. Yeah. Oh, fifty thousand. <laughs> you can build a model for yeah. fifty. Traditional, you know, traditional stick built home is going to be a lot more money than all these ideas we're going to give you when compared. Because three kind of uniting principles to these these alternatives we're going to talk about today. They're very DIY friendly. So if you don't have a ton of experience as a contractor, these are a good route to go. They are usually pretty able to do in stages, right? So you can get a shell up and then you can finish the insides and then you can plumb them, that sort of thing, right? So mm -hmm. if you are self-financing, that's pretty helpful. And most of these work pretty well off-grid, which... As we talked about in our last podcast episode, if you missed it, go back and listen to that one. When you're going from scratch, oftentimes going off grid will save you money. We have a few different alternative buildings that we've been looking at since we started this. Let's build a homestead from scratch. Yeah, and the Yurt Dream came back. The Yurt Dream came really, back. Really, like strong in power space. player. Yep. The Yurt. Why? Oh man. Why for you? Because I okay. know for me. So let's dive right in. Number one is a alternative kind of housing is a yurt. And the reason why it has always shown back up on our list of like kind of houses we've considered. Easy to build. Mm -hmm. 
Like, literally, you see videos of people putting them up in a weekend. Yeah, because once again, we are not builders. No, no. I think we have, and you especially have really honed your skills on the homestead of a builder, a construction man. You grew a mustache. Yeah. So, there we go. There it is. I mean. Uh, but, 14 years ago, I mean... I wouldn't have had you build me anything to live in <laughs> and stayed there with my children. A yurt comes as a kit. You have the walls, the roof. Yep, the fabric that surrounds it, the insulation. All you're doing is most of the time supplying a platform to put it on. Yeah. They go up fast. Easy, relatively easy to assemble. They come with instructions. They're really cool. Yeah. Like, they're pretty. Yeah, they they got this really beautiful, elegant thing going on yeah. in a yurt. Uh, for me, the ease of it always appealed. Like, we could have our home up in a weekend. Just to Just give you... Just didn't seem intimidating. Yeah, and to give you an idea of what we're talking about, smaller yurt packages start around $10,000, $15,000, whereas your, you know, 900-square-foot yurt, usually around thirty to $50,000 yes, packages. Yeah, because yeah, they'll all have... The variety of what you're looking for. Are you looking for something to support a snow load? Yep. More insulation, glass windows versus the vinyl windows. Like there's a lot of variation in the accessories yep. or the upgrades. Yeah, but super quick to get up. Beautiful, elegant looking building. And easy to over time turn from just a shell, which is basically what you're paying for in the yurt kit. You're getting the shell. You can add some solar panels to your property and wire them in. You can add some plumbing. Usually yurts are built on decks. So easy enough to drill a few holes in your deck, get some pipes. Add a loft. Add a loft. Add separate uh, like walls for bathroom or living space. Yeah, they're, they're easy to customize. Yep. Now, downsides of the yurt. And this is why we've killed the yurt dream many times Once over again, the years. Once again, yeah. <laughs> time and time again. How many different times of our life have we been like, yes, it's a yurt. Let's order it. And then, oh, but here's where the cons of the yurt are. I feel like for us 15 years ago starting out with one baby. We would have had a yurt. We would have had a yurt. Yeah. Because it was what we could afford, especially because we could have gone with a smaller size. And ideally, that's what a yurt is, right? It's on the Mongolian deserts where they need it to be super movable and it's fabric and it's short and it's small to retain all that heat in the cold climate. What? When you think about, this is literally a home built from uh, people who were pastoral people. Yeah. They had livestock that they had to move because the the food was scarce in the, the tundra. They had to move where there was more food for their animals or for war or whatever reasons. But it's like if you picture this beautiful pastoral lifestyle, a yurt is perfect. Mm -hmm. But who of us are living that kind of pastoral lifestyle, right? We Don't get our five acres and we set up our home and our yurt's going to sit there. And we're not, we personally don't live in a arid desert environment so moisture is something you got to worry about yep yep um heating it the insulation uh, the of bigger the bigger you the bigger you get which we would need at this point with eight people the bigger you get the more space it's going to be to heat yep and, and it loses heat quickly yeah it's yeah. not like insulute insulating <laughs> it's not like insulating a wall space this big it's you know tiny it's thin insulation yeah. And usually, even if you get some yurt companies will sell you the improved insulation kit where you'll be more in, well insulated, you're still going to go through more firewood, more gas, whatever you're going to use to fuel, heat. More fuel, yeah. You're going to burn up more. There's only so much insulation you can add to your yurt. So, yeah, that's one of the things we're really trying to work out in our next home is balance the need we have for space with the desire we have for economy and conservation of, of fuel. That's a big one. The yurt really, really appealed to us on this new project. And for a while we were leaning into, let's do the yurt again. But the idea that every summer, spring, summer, fall, we'd have to stack firewood and we'd have to stack two, cords two and cords three of times as much to heat this space as some of the other things we're gonna talk about today. 
we're trying to, and this is where everyone's decisions are going to be different, but we right. are trying to build not cheap. We're not trying to cut corners. We're trying to be cost effective. And in the long run, spending a bit more on something you can insulate better will actually save us time, money, energy in the long run. So that's an area we didn't want to skimp. We're probably not going to be in a yurt. Right. When the yurt company, one yurt company I looked up was like, can, can you, F8, frequently asked questions. Can you live in a yurt with children? Sure, <laughs> with one child it would be fine. But once you start having more than that, a small cabin is probably a better idea. I was like, and Even this the is the yurt company telling me that. <laughs> but it was very honest <laughs> way to approach it. Because another issue is sound. You're living in oh, what is, is a, a tent. Yep. So you're hearing all the outside sounds. You're, you're hearing everybody in your house, all the sounds that are going on. And we know six kids make a lot of noise. And we're, we're going smaller. We know we have to go smaller. We can send the kids outside as long as the weather's good enough. But there's going to be times where we're inside. There's going to be times when the baby's sleeping and kids be quiet. And you just want to be able to shut a door, and have a quiet space. Yeah. So, yeah, once again, the yurt dream dies. <laughs> a guest, a guest cabin, you. wouldn't it be great for like oh, a guest yeah. cabin? Or two people starting out with one baby. Like, there's definitely, I think, a place for a yurt. Especially 100%. if you can get a smaller size and you don't have to go like the big, most expensive one. Oh, yeah. They're hot in the summer in the full sun. Cold in the winter. Oh, yeah. What well, just is not the right choice for us right now. Yeah. But maybe for you. <laughs> Speaking of nomadic, something you see a lot in the nomadic movement. Uh, people who want to have their own space for themselves, but aren't really sure where they want to live, right? Modern day nomads. Tiny home on wheels. The thou, as they call it? So. So. Tiny house on wheels. Tiny house on wheels. All the rage on YouTube. Seeing them on Instagram. Yeah. They had the TV shows going there for a little while. Basically, it's a tiny, tiny home. Tiny, like really small. So the reason they cost less is because they're tiny. Right. But if you're looking at one that's made right somebody else has constructed it and they are not no. an inexpensive option for a home yeah they're going you're looking at like eighty thousand. because they're really good quality if someone's building it and they're a good worker right they're a good quality home on a good quality trailer so you're paying for the mobility and you're paying for the quality craftsmanship yes but the reason I have it on our outline, the reason we're talking about it is because it is by nature, because it's small, more affordable. Yeah. And there are a lot of ways for a small family to approach this, like buy yourself the trailer that you need and build up your little tiny house or buy, I've seen people buy box trucks. Oh yeah. You know, there's the vans, van life. There's, yeah. there's a lot of things people are doing in this really tiny space that's working for them. This is kind of one of those areas where the principle is just build small. And if you don't have your own land, the tiny house on wheels is a nice option because you can find a place to park, set up your little homestead, and then move to when you do have land. I think the minute you have a property you know you want to be on for a while, the tiny house on wheels is no longer really a great idea because, again, it's expensive home on an expensive trailer. But the concept of... Small. Building smaller. And this is something we've really approached. We studied tiny homes a lot over the last month or two, the design of tiny homes. Because they're very clever with design. So clever with space usage. So I feel like for most people in our shoes who have a few more kids and are looking to set up on their homestead, take the concept of a tiny home and just go small. Yeah. Right? We can't go tiny. No. Uh, if, if you think about what tiny is and people are thinking like is it below 200 square feet 300 square feet like what is it we there's no way we could do that no yeah will we have 50 square feet per person 100 square feet per person like is that what you consider tiny then 
then yeah, each of us will have our own little <laughs> tiny space in a small house. Yeah, our family will have a small home that feels tiny by, you know, how many people into the space. But if we design it, and that's where I think there's a lot of value in at least looking into tiny homes, look at how they design things, look at how they take advantage of lofts and what you put under a loft versus storage. what has a vaulted ceiling. Mm. How do you put you storage? Make a, a small space feel big. Tiny homes, it's on the list. Uh, like I already said, I, did I already put this disclaimer out there? Yeah, I think I did. <laughs> there are, you can spend a ton of money on a tiny home right. and they can be totally not cost effective. I right. know we're gonna see in the comments on this video like, no, you're crazy, those aren't a good use of money. If you DIY a, a smaller tiny home and you design it to be cost effective, you can do it, but not all are going to be. So. No, and there are plenty of videos out there of people who have done it. So check yeah. those out if you want to look into those tiny homes on wheels. Now, losing the wheels, taking the tiny home concept, right? Losing the wheels and just making a small space work and saving a lot of money there. Something we've seen a lot of doing our research is shed homes. Yeah, shed conversions. Shed conversions. You've been looking at this one, I think, more than I have. Well, because once you're on your, you look up small homes, affordable, you go from like yurt, shed, all these ones start like just falling into place. You keep seeing these. Okay, let's let's look up a shed home conversion. So you take a shed. It can be from a box store, from a local shed. We have a lot of Amish and Mennonite in our area who yeah. we could get a shed from, and you finish it out to be a home. So that means adding the proper insulation, the vapor barriers. What do you call when you let humidity out? Ventilation. <laughs> that you would want to have living in a small space. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I watched a video on YouTube. I think it was, was it the Druid's Den? Somebody found a shed, a big shed that was it was repo, a repo. Right? yeah and they it was probably a thirty thousand dollar shed they got for like seventeen thousand dollars so imagine the we talked about the yurt before but the thing with the yurt is you get this nice tent essentially now you're talking about the same square footage but it's hard walls and it's there already and it's there already so you've got your land you sold your house. Where are we going to live? You don't want to couch surf. You don't want to go move in with your parents <laughs> for too long. Hey, maybe. But, like, you get a shed. Put it on your property. And you're that much quicker to have a place to get into. Now, I know this would be a good option for me because I have never built a house. And if I didn't have people in my family who could say, hey, we'll help you build a house, this would be a great option. Oh, yeah. There are people out there who are going to say, no, don't do that. You're paying too much, and the quality is not going to be good. And we, we always, we, we can approach this with like a thousand disclaimers <laughs> every time. Welcome to the Disclaimer Podcast. We're going to spend 30 minutes telling you why none of this actually is good advice. But this would work. Sorry. I know. It's like you have to give all these disclaimers because people are going to be like, well, that, they steal your money, and it's garbage, and... It will work. It'll totally work. Yeah. Is it the best option? Not for everybody. Is it the best option for you? Maybe. Yeah, the shed conversion. Why this is more affordable than, for example, getting a contractor there to stick build, right? A, We actually recently went and toured a shed and cabin facility. A lot of their floor models we saw, their workshop. We're trying to answer a very important question today. Hello? We're going to be moving into a much smaller home, a tiny home. Question. How tiny is too tiny? tiny. <laughs> Does size really matter? Let's answer that question today. Oh, hey, oh, those are nice. Look at those. Ooh, kid in the candy store. I love these little porches, these are great. Basically what they're doing is they're buying all their materials in bulk. And oftentimes you'll find in our area, there's a lot of Mennonite and Amish communities who are producing these. So it's a family business, you got the kids involved, you got grandpas involved. They're able to 
with bulk products and a big family push, produce these buildings inside year round. It might make it economical for them, right? They've got, they can buy everything in bulk like this. They've got the building, oh, so yeah. put everything together all through the winter. Build it year round, just build it inside. They've got their basic structures down. They can buy materials in bulk. They have a system of just boom, 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 making these cool little cottages. If it was me, Pretty some, simple, like, pretty quick. Yeah, they're simple build, just a, just a basic structure. And so it's fast, it goes up fast. They're able to save money on the buying of the materials and the labor, which then they can sell to you for less than you could pay a contractor to custom build you something on your property. And now you're inside of a building and you have your time to, like we said, build in stages, right? Finish Be it off like grid. Want, yeah. yeah. And now this is kind of leads us into the next item on our outline here, prefab cabins. Same concept of the shed. Now, the place that we went to and looked at, the sheds and the cabins were being built by the same company. The difference was really in a little bit of the craftsmanship in the cabins were more intricate. Also, they, they put the insulation. Framing, yeah, the framing was different. Yeah. Okay, first up is the 14 by 24 two-story cottage. This thing sells for about $30,000. It is putting a, like, like we should see how big this one is because this feels so small. This feels like... It feels, I mean, for bedrooms, plenty big. Yeah. For down here. So but here is a really great tip, not for everybody, but for certainly a lot of you watching. Certain states have cabin clauses where these companies that make these prefab cabins, if they get buy one from them and have it delivered to your property, you don't need permits. How is that going to save you money, you may ask? I want to make sure this is true, what you're saying. I've already looked this up. Oh, okay. Cabin clauses. Cabin clauses. Sounds like a... Unlikable. The guy told me, the sales guy told me, you think he lied to me just to get me the to buy a cabin? Guy. It's a thing, baby. Santa Claus cabin is what I get. Cabin clause. <laughs> cabin clause. Some states will not require you to get any permits on that structure. How does that save you money? Well, the minute you need to get permits, they cost money. You need to get inspections. And with that, you're going to have to do certain things to code that on an off-grid property where nobody has to come around and inspect anything, you might be able to not do certain things that they want you to do, you'll be able to save money not having to install things you don't want on your off-grid homestead. Mm -hmm. Put things on your property you didn't want on your off-grid homestead. So you can, by getting a prefab cabin and not needing permits, now again, this is only certain states. You're gonna have to do your own research to see if it happens in your state. But now you know it exists, go and see if there's any cabin clauses that you can take advantage of. And maybe a prefab cabin is just right for you. Cabin Claus did not bring up anything, by the way. It's mostly Santa Claus cabin. So. <laughs> she fact checking me. I'll have to prove it after before I no, edit this podcast. No, I'll just say what would be the, the thing to Google would be like cabin exemptions or something. Cabin exemptions. Because Cabin Claus is going to take you to the North Pole, I think. <laughs> this is Cabin Claus. Ho, ho, ho. Cabin Claus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We are leaning away from the shed conversion because you and your dad can build a shed. Yeah. I don't know whether your dad wants to build a shed with you, but you can. Yeah. The cabin, on the other hand, is, uh, I think, pretty high up on our list of maybe. The one thing for me was I, I wasn't thrilled with any of the layouts of the ones we found. Mm. They're small. Yeah. And if it's if you you find a cabin builder with one of these ready-made cabins and you're able to make your own personalizations to it, would be great. Yeah, usually that's where the cost starts to go up. Right. So the minute you start, this is a good little bonus tip here. Anything we're talking about that's prefab, and we're going to get to more things in a minute here. If you have prefab kits, standardized, and you're willing to take them, good. The minute you say, oh, but could I just get a... That's where it starts to yeah, get Yeah, like, oh, I like that nice Can log look on the front. And... Okay, well, that's extra. And I want yeah. this much more insulation. Well, that's extra. I want to change this layout. Well, that's extra. Yeah. And that's when it starts to be like, 
Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Pros to the cabin. Again, you have a shell quickly. If you're not a craftsman, if you're not a carpenter and you just want to get something in, there you go. Yeah, you don't trust yourself to make the structural parts of it. Possible permit exemptions, depending on where you live and what laws there are. So that's fantastic. Cons to the cabin are... You have to watch out for the quality. Make sure you're really getting a quality sure. product. And, and that, I think, is a con right there. Because it is a, you know, assembly line, they're not going to be looking for the finest materials. One of the reasons we're leaning away and looking more into building our own as opposed to buying a prefab is we feel like with what you will spend on the prefab, we're probably going to be able to build something similar for the same price, but with better quality materials. Mm. Because fortunately for us, we have both your dad and my dad who yeah. are builders, builders, competent, and whereas maybe just us alone, we wouldn't feel like, yeah, we can do this. With their help, we feel like we can do it. So, yeah. so that kind of led us to... <laughs> Building our own cabin? There's some really inspirational YouTube videos out oh, there yeah. that make building a cabin seem totally doable. Yes. Kyle's Cabin is one of them. Bush Radical. Watched a lot Bush of Bush Radical. Radical. Yeah. Uh, there's the log cabin. There's the... We got to the point where everything was so overwhelming. You're like, well, how do people do it? Like, how did they ever just make a home... Well, they do a log cabin. So we watch these log cabin oh, building man. videos. If you want to, like, soothe yourself to sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> if you're having trouble sleeping, I have some advice for you. Tuck in. Take a, take a cold plunge. Jump in your warm covers. And then tuck in for a night of watching people build log cabins. With and, hand uh, tools. Some ASMR of them. style, you know. Yeah, you fell asleep really fast. I, was, I have no idea how to build a log cabin, but I you got some really, really good, good sleep. Yeah, it, and it's amazing what they do. Because you think, they've been building houses for thousands of years. Why can't we just build our house? And we could. There, There is a ton of work involved. I In think a log that's, cabin, yeah. There you go with a con, right? And do we have the lumber to do that? We would need to age it. Uh, you it, don't need to age it. Don't need but. to age it, but they do it recommend will it. Shrinkage it will is shrink. an issue, so. Yeah, so would we be buying logs and bringing them them in? Like that starts to get like cost prohibitive again. If you have a property where you have mature trees that are like good a lot of these trees. guys are moving to these properties that are totally wooded yep and they're ch chopping down these trees and Whether putting them up it's oak trees i saw one video he talked about he uses oak trees uh i forget the other kinds but there's certain kind of trees that are better for cedar it. a lot of cedar yeah cedar mm -hmm. um mature trees this is totally an option. You can build yourself a log cabin. You can watch guys on YouTube take their own logs, drop them. And for a little while, we were really, really leaning into this one because it seemed like such a simple way to build. But, you know, back to basics. I think for us, what kept coming up with the log cabin is you're limited by your log size. Mm, we don't have a lot of mature hardwoods to spare our property on our property was logged before we moved on to it it was really really cleared at the top of the mountain where we're setting up our homestead there's very few trees so we definitely don't have a lot to choose from there and their log cabins there's maintenance there's moisture issues yeah but learning about them, once again, I think took us on this path towards then more traditional, natural building, you could yes. call it. <laughs> uh, which includes cob or rammed earth, lots of permaculture stuff, straw bale. That it's kind of like a whole new world, underground buildings. 
that would save money, theoretically could save you a lot of money if we, what your, your building is being constructed of the supplies right from your own property, the clay, the dirt. Uh, what you're spending then is time, lots and lots of time. Yeah. So that's the next category is the natural building, natural buildings. And under that category, we could do a whole podcast on each individual one of these. And actually, we do have a couple interviews planned. Um, but straw bale homes. Straw bale homes are a roof and lumber, generally, a roof and lumber framed. The walls are then formed by bales of straw. So that's your insulation. That's your insulation. That's your walls. Most of them don't rely on the straw bales for structure. Most or for um, mm-hmm. for load bearing. Load bearing. Most of them don't. Yeah, don't use the straw bales. But they're there for insulation. They do provide the walls. These started in Nebraska when they didn't have trees, just lots of straw in the early 1900s, and they used them as load bearing walls. And there are ones still standing today. So it's totally a viable building option. We have looked real hard into straw bale yeah. building right now. Um, when we stumbled across this, this was like the first one I think we've been homesteading a long time. We've been looking at all these different ideas. Straw bale homes, it was like, whoa, who's this? <laughs> Who are you? Yeah, they're beautiful. And it seems so doable, mm-hmm. right? They're like giant Legos. You just yeah, you buy your straw bales. Now, as is true of everything, like doesn't a log cabin look like Lincoln Logs? But nothing's that easy in building. <laughs> and that's always the point where I hit a bunch of like overwhelm. Is like, okay, I could totally do this. I can stock, stock, I, I could stack straw bales on top of each other and then a lime plaster and it'll be great. But nothing's that easy. So nothing's that easy or that inexpensive. So it is trying to make sense of cost, energy, what it will save us. Hmm. Yeah, and that's something we're still looking into. But Maintenance, how, uh, how durable they are, yeah. Looking at straw bale homes, uh, basically you take the straw bales, you stack them, and then you cover them in a plaster, a mix, and a lot of people mix that by their own natural materials. And that's where we stumbled across cob building, which is essentially sometimes you'll see straw bale homes with cob, sometimes just cob on its own. Cob is a mixture of clay and sand and straw blended up you make a like a plaster and you build your walls out of Mm -hmm, plaster bricks yeah there's some um, incredible videos on youtube of people who literally molded their homes like out of clay out of cob bit by bit they built the walls of their home from the mud and the clay on their property and this one I think is so cool because right now we just finished up, if you watch the YouTube channel, you know, we just finished up a huge project. We dug a pond on Sunny Mountain, our new homestead property, and we have tons of clay. Today was a awesome day on the pond dig. We actually made a ton of progress, which is good because the last few days have been lots of hiccups and lots of things going wrong. This back here we got our dam started the back corner and we're coming into the corner here where we're going to have like a little overflow and uh all clay everything we excavated here beautiful beautiful clay which is why we moved this pond down into this direction so we'd be in really good clay now this is cool this is a surprise for us Uh, uh, this was a nice surprise as we started digging this way we're digging into this more gravel shale stuff, which is not good for the pond. But we have seen that as we go deep down to where we want the bottom of the pond to be, there seems to be a nice layer of clay underneath the shale. So we'll have to excavate a lot of this shale, a couple more days of really, really big digging and maybe hauling it off of this location with a truck. We can use it in other spots on the property, so that's okay. Uh, But to have clay underneath it means we don't have to do any repacking. So this pond dig, if we continue at the pace we had And as we were digging the pond, we built the dam out of it. We still have a huge pile of clay left over. And I've been thinking like, oh man, we have all this 
clay, if we would mix it with sand and some straw, we could build a home out of it. So there's that incredible appeal of like building from your natural materials. Now, what's harder about this is the time it takes to accomplish that. Yeah. Especially because we've never done that before. Also, we've bought a few books on this at this point. We've been looking into straw bales and earth homes. There's, there, it's an art. There's people who've been doing it for years and years and years who develop the art to do it correctly. And there is an issue where if you don't do it correctly, things break. Yeah, it could just be down. a disaster, right? Like you could spend years working on this and... It fails. Yeah. And I think that would be really devastating. Yeah. I kind of see our family is very <laughs> a matured family. Like, we have older kids. We still have young babies. You and me are getting older. A lot of the videos I see are, like, young couples who started their earth home before the first baby. Right. And now have worked, you know, a baby or two into it and are growing. I wonder for us if now's the time to start learning this. That's, I think, where we are with a lot of these natural building methods is we're very far along in our homesteading life and journey. If we were with one baby looking to get started, yeah, it might be a better spot to start learning this before we have a house full of children ready to break our clay walls and yeah. floor. Yeah, and it's I feel like it's hard to get a really unbiased opinion of these things. It's hard to come by. You can buy the books and of course they're going to be like all in favor of doing this. Oh, or yeah. you can look on the forums and then you'll find that one person who says, this was awful, this didn't work for me for this reason. You're like, okay, was that their own particular set of circumstances, the mistakes they made in building, or is this an issue with the product across the board? So it's really hard because what we're saying is we want to save energy, not just our energy, but the materials that go into this that have made the, these materials embodied energy. We want to save on on oil, gas, wood for heat, whatever we're going to do. We really want to make good decisions with this. Practical, not starry-eyed, not, <laughs> not isn't this awesome, this was perfect, but realizing the pros and cons of all of these things. Yeah, and I think that this episode today we're trying to give you, because obviously we haven't built any of these. We haven't done any of these. We've researched a lot of different options, and we are not biased. So we're kind of giving you a researched, unbiased overview of different ideas that you can say for you personally. Like, I want to look more into that. Yeah, like, oh, that's interesting. I never knew you could build a home out of straw bales. I would like to learn more about that. Or, oh, you know, yurts sound pretty cool. Maybe I'll (laughs) check one out. Even though it might not be right for us in our current place in life, that might be a great option for you. And every single one of these, there's a video on YouTube that looks incredible and has been a huge success and saved them so much money and every one of these there's a video on youtube that says never build this (laughs) biggest mistake people make so what do you do uh fortunately we've found lots of people who are able to talk to us about these different types of buildings straw bale cob um earthen floors yeah that's another one we're looking at earth Earthen floors. Yeah, how do you save the money Adobe on not, floors. not pouring concrete, which is so expensive? Uh, nearby us, we have a straw bale house that we can go look at. at We're going to go look at. They have a yurt that we can check out. So, so yeah, we are going to do the footwork to find and look at these places and see if these would actually work for us, if they're worth our time. We're really... That's that's the currency we have most. (laughs) Yeah. That's a great thing to bring up. You have to balance your actual money, your energy, your time. A lot of these earth um, materials, these natural building materials, require a lot of time. And maintenance, upkeep in the future. Just to give you an example, with straw bale homes, my parents went and took a straw bale workshop. They went down to a home in Texas and learned how to build straw bale homes. And they had a crew of 30 30 to 40 people. 
and they were not able to complete the walls of this home in one week. So they got the straw. People. Yeah, they got the straw all put in, stacked, but they were only able to spend a few hours showing them the technique of the plaster. Yeah. Which is a huge part of what makes the straw bale effective. So pros of the natural building are obviously the pros of lower cost in materials if, if you, you have can them. source them there. Locally. Yeah. Straw local to you, good quality straw, the the mud, the clay, the plaster, if you can make it yourself. The benefit of the DIY element, right? You can learn to stack straw bales pretty simply. You can learn to make some plaster to rub on smear on your walls. But then there's the downside. There's a downside of tons of manual labor and the, you know, do you have the experience to build your own plaster floor right the first time? Do you need it to be right the first time? So Yeah, and in the natural building world, there are lots and lots of workshops you could sign up for. Yeah. Um, where basically they're looking for free labor <laughs> and you're paying for the experience. Uh, but it can be very educational, especially if you get to the point where you're thinking, I definitely want to do this. I definitely want to do straw yeah. bale. You can pay to go to a workshop. Yeah, I, it's tough because you and me have said no to so many of these things. Uh, I, I don't want to be overly negative in our delivery on them because yeah. there are people out there who should build a Cobb home. Right. We have leaned away from a lot of these. We're further along in this decision-making process than we're even talking about right now on YouTube. We're not like sharing where exactly we're leaning into. We've come through a lot of these. I mean, we've walked through your. we've mm -hmm. walked through... Um, container. What, we haven't should talked we about, talk about I was just about to say next one we should jump right in is that container homes we've walked through all of these and we've leaned out of them so we feel negative about them but they might be perfect for someone yeah. so just introducing them with a fair you know there's a reason people build these other types of homes we might not want to but you might no silver bullet uh, we'll talk about that at the end of all this is like you know that's it now going to maybe what might seem as the total opposite <laughs> of, yes. of the natural building so true uh is the shipping container house shipping container houses i will be 100 percent honest this has not appealed to me once ever ever you know it's so funny because <laughs> we just said at the break like let's try to give everything a really <laughs> positive spin at first introducing them with a fair shipping container houses this has not appealed to me once ever ever <laughs> Positive spin at first because we don't want to discourage people. But with, you this liked might be it. right you for you. You like this. Well, I like it. And you know, these things, and I see what appeals to me the most generally are like when they come across as being very easy. Yeah. Like as soon as things start getting technical and I start seeing like angles and measurements, it's intimidating. And I'm like, but a shipping container is right there. There's a shipping container. And then the more we looked into it, we re realized, like, there is some <laughs> but work given, involved. But what's good about it? What's good about uh, it? Well, it's there. You've got your roof, your floor, and all, your walls. They're ready. They're easy to find. Yep. There's, they're always being sold. Different sizes. Your dad and my dad both own multiple shipping containers. Yeah. Like, there they are. Yeah, they have them. Yeah, so you can buy a smaller one, a larger one, a taller one. You can stack them. Have I mean, people will take like two and then a third on top and put a staircase up into them. Now, I think this is one of those areas where the money people spend to turn a ugly metal container <laughs> Not into that you're biased or anything. Nice. The, the reason, honestly, the reason I don't like the shipping container home, for me personally, I always feel claustrophobic in a shipping container. Now, square footage, you might get the same from a yurt as a shipping container, but it's those tight walls. Yeah, because it's got to be, it's got to go on the road. And we watched on YouTube, we watched a lot of tours of people's shipping container homes, and they look very pretty and warm, but they always feel squeezed to me. So you have to do a, more work than you think is necessary. And the work here involves welding, yeah. cutting metal... Uh, adding windows, adding doors, adding width to them if you want. And all this is 
not easy. You're, you're disturbing the structural integrity of that. So people will bury them and there's a big, should you do that or not? People will cut holes in them. Should you do that or not? Like, it's not an easy thing no. to figure out. No, but it might once be you for start, you. Once you start altering the shipping container. Yeah. So it's an option. But not one for us. Not one for us, but maybe for you. Maybe you want to be one of those. Got this stack like eight of them. <laughs> that would be our house. <laughs> and then build a They're roof really cool. Over. They do some really cool stuff with them. Yeah. So yeah, we've watched really neat videos about that. And some of them just look don't even look like a shipping container. But no. They also take a lot of work to not look like that. There was a company, we watched a video, their their thing is turning every individual shipping container into a unique experience. They had the beach shipping container, hmm. they had the mountain, the farm, it had the Gambrel roof shipping container. So cute. They just very, very cute. But the amount of money into those things. Yeah. The amount of work. And work, yeah. Which Again, I come back to, well, if I'm going to put that much work and money into into a thing, I don't want to, to alter already it. Yeah, if you're going to do tight. so much to change it, why not just build something out of wood? Pros, you have the shell, very sturdy, very structural, right there, ready to go. Biggest cons for me is the, the tightness, the crampness. Yeah. yeah, they're pretty small. But might be a good choice for you. However... I feel like we've walked through this journey. This is the journey you and me have taken over the last four months. We have dove deep into every one of these home types. We've spent the week thinking we were going to live in a shipping container. We've spent the week thinking we were going to live in a yurt. Where we are currently is a combination of, I think, all these. I feel like as in this economy, right, where... The price of everything is so much right now. Fuel, lumber's come down, steel's come down. That's great. A year ago, it was crazy. Uh, it's still, we're just going to spend more than our parents did to build a house. Oh, yeah. 40 years ago. Um, the advantages we do have are the internet. So all this stuff that our parents would have never heard of 40 years ago, unless they went to a library and looked up alternative building, uh, we have it to look at videos at the touch of a finger. Oh, yeah. Plus, the instructional videos out there are endless. Yep. So the education available to us about building house, it's also kind of been bad because it's been overload sometimes where you think, I, I'll call him every day, Austin, I figured it out. Got this it. is how we do it. This, is, this is how we do an affordable, easy living structure in a year, we can do it. And I'm like, what is that? And you're like, look, I got three books coming from Amazon. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I've never heard of that. And then I get home and the three books arrive because it's Amazon Prime. And then I start looking at it. I'm like, oh, okay. No, I see how this goes. Yeah, I like this. And by the time I finished learning what it is. I'm, I'm, I'm like, it won't work. Forget they're it. They're awful. I read a Reddit thread that nobody likes them they're the worst yeah one i was like this is it this is it this is perfect i ordered the book strawbale no nope. earth home uh earth. underground underground the book hasn't even arrived i canceled the book i had a, i like i was convinced so quickly that this what uh, that it was the perfect idea to this is not going to work before within two it, hours before, before they had they even, even sent the book i canceled the book by the time <laughs> you got home i was like it's not going to work. Yeah, you sent me a text like, this is it. And I was like, great. I got home. Because, so tell me about it. And that's it. one of those things where I'm like, it seems perfect. And everybody's saying this is a great idea. And then you like dig a little deeper. No pun intended. Mm -hmm. And it's like, is this true? Because it seems like a little sus. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little too good to be true. So if anything seems too good to be true, like it seems like, wow, this is so cheap, but so wonderful and it'll be perfect for me like yeah there's always going to be cons but all that to say we've researched and researched and watched tons of videos and learned so much and it has led us where your dad got to give credit where credit's due we were touring some prefab cabins and had prices and pictures and we sent him some and he was like wow you know that's a lot a of lot of money. wood <laughs> a lot of wood he is, he's a fabricator. Oh, of course, yeah. So, yeah. He's not a fan of wood. He's a metal worker. Constructing, yes. He's a metal worker. So he said, that's a lot of wood. 
And for the same price... Wood to him means maintenance. Yes, yes. Whereas metal is forever. Metal is forever. <laughs> so he said, you know, for that price, because we were looking at a, a garage cabin that was about $30,000 for the shell for about 500 square feet. And he said, you know, for that price, you could get a bigger pole barn. Which we've lived in a pole barn when we first moved down here. For the first year we were in Pennsylvania, we had made the upstairs of a pole barn into an apartment for did us. the barn dominium, right? We lived in a yeah, thousand I guess square we did. foot barn dominium. Oh man, a lot of stairs. <laughs> oh man, this thing's huge. Yeah. This is huge. No. It feels so much bigger than what I, like, would it look than it is on an 8 by 11 and a half. Yeah. <laughs> it was a pole barn that just was storing the machines that your dad had, the tractor. It's a pole barn on our property here that we use still up in the top. Yeah, he had the upstairs. So it was unfinished, just open space that we decided to make into our our living space for the year. And that 1,000 square foot barn dominium space, we actually turned, we f we finished it. What did it cost? Do you remember? We have a whole video on YouTube. 30, yeah, I thought it was 30,000 to finish the interior. In the end, that project ended up costing around $30,000 to put in the apartment above the pole barn. The materials to convert that space was probably around Ten to twelve thousand dollars, and then probably about eighteen, twenty thousand was on contractors to do the electrical work, do the plumbing, uh, and that was kitchen, that was yeah, bathroom, appliances, the whole thing, flooring. So it was kind of like, duh, why didn't we think of this before? I guess I th I kind of slid into traditional building. I did not realize how much money you can save per square foot building a pole barn or someone, it's one in every crowd, right? Somebody's gonna correct me. It's not a pole barn, it's a, what do they call them? Post and beam building. Oh, yeah, right? that's the difference. Uh, somebody always gotta correct you, it's you too. <laughs> Post and beam building, or as we call them around here, pole barns. Because they're poles. The, the thing about a pole barn, it on the outside, it's a metal sided building generally. You got the metal roof, but it looks pretty traditional. It doesn't look like a straw bale home or a cob home or, you know, a weird tiny home or a yurt. It just looks like a normal building. And I just assumed like, oh, that's going to be as expensive as a stick built. But because you're using a lot bigger, the poles or the four by fours and six by sixes you build this with, your span in your lumber is a lot bigger, which means you need less. And your metal siding it's still thin it's not structural you can save a lot of money per square foot building a pole barn which we now know because we have been watching barn dominium videos for the last week or two i don't i don't i'm gonna say you it hate now. it i don't like the term barn dominium why i will not be using it well it's from condominium yeah, and it's not a condominium so it's What's the point? People just think it sounds clever, but I don't like it. What so do you I'm, want to call it? Our home. Ah, a pole barn house. I could live with that. It's not as nice. catchy. It's not as catchy. You're a real marketer. You got a knack for this. <laughs> I just don't. I would like to call it the building we built out of metal and 4 and by 4s and 6 by 6s Put them into the ground. And took about six months and lots of labor. Eh. T.M. But not Barn Dominium. Not Barn Dominium. No. Everyone else can use it. I don't care. <laughs> We're not going to say it. Yeah. It also, yeah, it's kind of an exciting, because this is an issue, I think, worldwide, and especially lands that are hit by hurricanes or earthquakes, is finding a way to put up affordable housing quickly. When we're looking at finding something that is durable. Now, there's a balance, right? I've been reading books about green construction. So there is a balance between everything's going to have a cost to produce it. 
this steel will have a cost to produce. Now, the fact that you don't have to replace it in our lifetime, that will bring that net energy footprint down. Do you understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So like steel, is that a green way to build? Well, when you look at the overall picture, it could be more practical than for us even wood. So, <laughs> that so edit me. that, enjoy that. That reminds me of tip number uh, 44 on our list of affordable <laughs> homes, which was Plastic bottle home. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they do that with a cob, not plastic, but they do the glass they bottles. They stack, picture like 37,000 pull and spring bottles. Do, 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 All stacked in walls around the whole house is made of I mean, we've looked at the pallet cobbins, right? Oh, pallet house was on that list. with with cob. Pallet house was on it. Think of cordwood. That's There really has been so many. Pallet house was on the list, and I didn't say it as one of the funny things in the beginning. Because it was totally Because it was like, well, yeah, man, pallet house. Yeah, totally. You can live in a pallet. Okay, so the fact that... With these pole barns, they're finding ways to insulate them so effectively. Yeah. Uh, but they're easy and quick to put up. Like, they're they're a really nice, viable housing option. This is where we're leaning very, very right now, very, very <laughs> hard into. Because, okay, we can get, just to give you an idea of prices we've been looking at, we can get a 30 by 30 pole barn shell. Now, this isn't your plumbing and your electric and it's not right, even it's not your insulation. foundation but this is not a cool thing foundation. about the pole barn you can put a pole barn up on piers you don't need to have your foundation done so we've been getting prices 15 to thirty thousand dollars for a shell which you say just a shell but literally i mean we're working on this homestead i'm there midweek i'm digging i'm working i'm would love to be grilling up some food for myself for lunch and hmm. well yeah yeah would you I don't know about that <laughs> I like getting Wendy's <laughs> but the point is that's a garage the minute it's up you're parking vehicles and you're equipment storing, in it yeah. you can store fuel right now I'm I'm carrying five gallon buckets of diesel back and forth. I got a building up. I can store fuel in that. I can yeah. store all kinds of things. A few months ago, we were even thinking because if we were going to do straw bale, right, we would need a place to store the straw bale. So we were going back and forth. And what do we put up first on this property? Do we put up a pole barn right. for all our storage for fuel or building supplies, straw bales, whatever it was we were doing? And now I think we're leaning towards why not just build the the pole barn, pole barn and for we'll us. live in it because we were getting these prices for a, a pole barn to you know just in store addition stuff to and a house. animals and things like man these things are very cost effective and you watch the videos of them going up now this is videos with a crew yeah, couple who guys have who have before. done it before but they're putting them up in two to three days mm -hmm. basically the system that you put a pole barn you drill your holes for the poles, which are four by fours or six by sixes. You drill, you know, 10 down one side, 10 down the other. You stand them up in it. You pour concrete. Now your poles are standing. You square them up. Then you attach them with horizontal pieces of two by six. And then you put your trusses over the top, metal on the top, metal on the sides. And in three days, fifteen to $30,000, you have a building. Yeah, and there's really cool inventions and genius things that they're coming up to do this stuff like the trusses the metal trusses that they'll have and yeah it's we always joke like i'm a metal worker's daughter so i always choose metal <laughs> <laughs> i think I Aust the metal Austin's, worker's daughter he's coming over to the dark side i, I come from a, a family of carpenters and i'm oh, married into true. a family of metal it's workers true. this is where our we will oh, ready truly for this? be combined. The pole barn is a hybrid of metal and wood. Did it? it is our union. <laughs> it is our union. <laughs> the metal worker's daughter and the carpenter's son. It's cute. It's pretty good.
yeah, uh, I'm excited about this because it seems very doable for us. I can incorporate some of these more green kind of building things like an adobe floor. This is a great point, and this is something that we wanted to say in this episode. There's no silver bullet, right? There's not one thing that's going to be really cheap and great. No, you, you can have anything. You can't have everything. Yeah, there's not. If there was a house out there that cost ten grand and was great for a family and was durable and energy efficient, everyone would live in it, right? But looking at all these different things has brought in all these different elements where now we're starting to piece together. Maybe we'll do, and we don't have the final plan yet, so this isn't a reveal or anything, but no. maybe we'll do pole barn walls metal trusses, metal roof, straw bale walls, adobe floor, like, yeah, we have all of this insight now, all these different techniques we could use. Now it's just for us going to be about piecing them together because we want, we want this not only to be affordable for us, but also to be able to inspire somebody else who's watching, take a little bit, say, oh, oh, yeah, I hate that adobe floor. That was awesome. I'm going to try that. Or straw bale. I hadn't heard of that. And we'll look into it and find out that it's right for you. Hopefully, all these things we're doing, these people we're interviewing with experience in these areas of construction will help other people be able to get onto their homestead property. And that's why we wanted in this episode cover all these different kinds is what is right for you will be wrong for us and vice versa. But if you learn about all the different things out there, maybe shipping tater home is perfect for yeah. you. Maybe you're super skinny and not claustrophobic. <laughs> and you can squirm around your little container. <laughs> <laughs> I just they just feel like an ant colony. Like they're so small and you gotta crawl through them. You're big dark. guy. What can I say? Dark I would shoulder. I would yeah, put in windows fast. And another door to get out because that would, only having one exit would not be nice. Our podcast is, our the extended versions of our podcast are available to the Home Study Pioneers. In this episode, we're going to dive into some designing ideas that we're incorporating into any home we build that will save some money. We're about to dive into that. So if you're a pioneer, Check that out. It's in the Pioneer Library, the extended version of this episode. And if you're not, there's a link in the description. Consider becoming a Pioneer. It's five bucks a month. Library full of extended versions of our podcast, interviews, classes. All that helps us produce this show. And in return, you get a ton of extra in-depth homesteading content. If you missed our last podcast episode, it's about how to have cheap land. So we're really trying to help you follow the path we've taken in saving money with land, saving money with building, have a lot more good ones to come. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And those of you who've joined Sit to Squat using our affiliate. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the joke is dead. <laughs>